Ok. Um, another reason why I have to apologize in advance is that since I have changed this lecture, uh, revamped things, fused things, I'm not 100% sure how long it is, but I think it's less time than I have. Cross fingers. Um, I will try to make sure that um, I, I hope that it's going to be okay, but I think so. Have a um, let's let's have a look. So today we're going to talk about. Uh, so th th in the first week we spoke spoke a lot about hardware, and then yesterday we spoke a lot about um, uh, uh, sam samples. Today we're going to talk about something that is very often, or two things that are very often forgotten, or just not nobody knows about it basically <laughs> well people know about it but many people do not unfortunately and it's a contrast and sampling i'm also going to try to put the, this uh, glue these concepts together with what we have done last week about the optical resolution where we uh, uh we had uh so i'm going to pin myself click right uh in the optical resolution where we had like um uh, you know, the the uh, resolution of the objective. So I'm trying to bridge the concepts that we have used uh, so far, plus the new things I'm telling you today. So what is a good microscopy image? Good microscopy images are rarely the most beautiful you acquire, and that's okay. So if you want to uh, acquire an image because you're going to actually publish it in a, a journal, you can, you know, set it in, in a way where it's like beautiful. But most images that we're going to acquire are not beautiful. And that's because what we want is data. And so, um, and very often acquiring beautiful images get in the way of us acquiring data. So we have to separate things. Do, do not go after beautiful images. So a good microscopy image is an image that is good enough in resolution and contrast to reliably answer the scientific question. So we have a very convenient word in Swedish called lagom that is means good enough. It's not too much and it's not too little. It's just right. So the resolution uh, is the resolution in the image. So it's the smallest distance between two points uh, that can be, so the two points in the sample, so it's in nanometers, that can be reliably distinguished in the image. So this we have seen uh, last week. Unfortunately, life happens in 3D and our microscope has a worse resolution uh, in Z compared to XY. So we have more information in the XY image than in the Z dimension because we have a better resolution. And the resolution in the image depends on several things. One of them is the optical resolution, 0.61 lambda divided by the numerical aperture of the objective and lambda being the emission uh, wavelength uh, of the floor four. And it depends also on the aberration. So we have seen all this. Please do not prepare a diffractive uh, sample and do not spit on, the, on your <laughs> sample before you put it on the microscope and this sort of things. And there are two more things, sampling and contrast, which we'll talk about today. So this we have seen before, each floor four in the sample forms by diffraction, an image shaped like a rugby ball with rings, it's the point spread function. And when the uh, two floor fours get closer to each other, the point spread functions merge. And you can see here, the floor fours are a bit far away from each other. So we have two clearly two point spread function. This is resolved, the two points are resolved. When they get a little bit closer, uh, they sort of start fusing, and when they are uh, very close to each other, that we cannot resolve them anymore. And this is the Rayleigh limit that we use, 0 0.61 lambda divided by Na. And uh, Rayleigh said that uh, there would be a 26, there must be a 26% dip between the two peaks of the point spread function. Um, yeah, that was the way he found it, but many people use it. So 0 0.61 lambda emission lambda divided by Na is the Rayleigh uh, resolution. In Z is 2N lambda 
uh, divided by n squared. That is the depth of field of the objective. And n is the refract refractive index of the uh, immersion medium of the objective. And these correspond to the x, y, and z radii, as I've heard you pronounce. Radii, yeah, it's the plural of radius. So uh, radii, it means this uh, and here. So the two radii of the point spread function, this is what we are using to calculate our resolution here. There are other equations available, but in different contexts, so we don't use them. And then we have the aberrations. Uh, the aberrations often limit the optical resolution. The sample is a part of the light path. And so also you could have um, issues with the objectives. It could be of a poor quality. Uh, it could be broken or it could be dirty, but that happens sometimes. Unfortunately, it does. But mostly it's refraction within uh, between the sample, the mounting medium, and the immersion medium of the objective. So refraction index mismatch. And that is very, very common. We have seen this many times in the course. And that creates a distorted, banana, a distorted PSF. So you can have banana-shaped PSFs. They go like whoop. And maybe you have seen that if you focus up and down. I think some students have reported that their PSF is banana shaped. And we can have also scattering and uh, both the excitation and the emission scatter. And especially when you go away from the cover slip, it gets worse. So then the P point spread function goes like a star. And we can also get dispersion, which is due to refraction, uh, where the colors focus at different Z planes. But then we have sampling and contrast. So unfortunately, contrast is often forgotten. It's a very important part of building an image uh, that uh, allows us to answer our scientific question. So what is contrast? It is the difference in intensity between the area of interest and its immediate surrounding. So without contrast, the image is useless, even if it has an excellent resolution. We have to think about it, and now I'm going to show this to you. And then sampling is also often forgotten or people have uh, sometimes never heard of it. So life is a continuous continuum uh, in space and intensities. So it's an analog signal. So it means it's a signal that keeps on changing in a very smooth way. Yeah, it's not like uh, in bits. So uh, vesicles, for example, can have any size. So the vesicle is going to keep growing. There's an infinity of size of vesicles. Membranes can have any intensities as well. So the point spread function is also a uh, the point spread function is also a, an analog signal, which means that if I go from here to here, I'm going to have varying intensities, but I have an infinity of uh, of uh, possible values. So to fully describe the point spread function, we need an infinity of numbers. And this is the reason why the point spread function, the f, means function, because it's a mathematical function, considering that light is, uh, is a very, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, it's, very, it's very reproducible. It has very reproducible behavior. We can predict what, how it's going to behave, and we can assign a mathematical function that describes the point spread function. Unfortunately, microscopy images are digital, and therefore we have a finite number of possible integer. So integer means one, two, three, four, and not 1.2. Integer values for coordinates and intensities. So uh, you cannot have an intensity of uh, 3.2. It's either three or four. So if we look at uh, <clears throat> this little schematic of uh, uh, an image, you will see each pixel has a coordinate in x and in y, and an in intensity, and all these are integers. So to represent the analog point spread function in a digital image, we need to measure the point spread function at discrete points. So it means specific points that will be displayed. And this gives the uh, concept of digital resolution or sampling. And that's what we're going to talk about. So how many measurement points do we need to measure here in this point spread function to actually be able to display it in uh, the image in a, uh, a, in a digital way? So let's have a look. Well, before we look at that, I want to point out that there is a confusion uh, because of all these terms that we use. The sample is an object. It's the specimen, so it's your tissues, it's your cells, and your zebrafish or something. 
Sampling, it's almost the same word, but sampling is an action. So it's the digitalization of uh, the signal that we're getting out of the objective. So this means that we are going to get discrete measurements of something continuous. The point spread function is continuous. We're going to measure it, measure it, measure it, measure it, and display our measurements. This is called sampling. So just uh, so that to make it clear. So contrast and sampling, that's what we're going to talk about. Let's see contrast. Without contrast, resolution is useless. You see this wonderful little bear. Uh, if we look at the image uh, with a very high contrast, this is what the image looks like. It has a very low resolution. And then all the way on the other side of the spectrum, we can get an image with a very high resolution. You can see here, you can, uh, I don't know if you can see on Zoom, uh, but you can see all the hair on the back of the uh, of the bear. We can see all the details in the grass and everything. This is a very high contrast image, but with a very low, uh, sorry, it's a high resolution image with a very low contrast. Both resolution and contrast are needed. If we have a high resolution and no contrast, we cannot do anything with the image. In an image with high resolution, low contrast, the resolution cannot be used. So here comes this uh, concept of usable optical resolution. So we're getting the optical resolution from the objective, but we cannot use it. And this is a little bit like transmitted light. We have a very high resolution in, in transmitted light. We use the same objectives, right? We can use the same wavelength, so we can have exactly the same resolution, but because of the low contrast, we cannot use that resolution. So, Unfortunately, imaging does not preserve contrasts of crowded edges. And this is something that is very well known of photographers. And so photographers, they like to measure things and the physicists also like to measure things. And so what they do is they can take image of uh, bars like this line. So if we have, if this is our objects and we have like a, a, a pattern of black and white uh, bars, uh, when we take this image, so if we would just draw a line here, this is the type of uh, of profile we're getting. It's either black or then it gets white, and then we have very sharp edges between the black and white. Okay, and we have a certain contrast, which is the difference between the black in intensity between the black and the white. But when we image, um, this is what the image looks like, and so it means that the edges are a little bit soft, and both the black and the white are slightly gray. OK, so when we have this type of um, of uh, of object, we're getting this type of image. But unfortunately, when we have this type of objects where we have very crowded edges. So if we draw a line like this, there's a very fast change across. If we travel from the left to the right of this image, we'll get black, white, black, white, black, white, very fast compared to this. So very fast changes across the image when we image this. Not only the edges are blurry, but also the contrast is much worse. You can see here that the contrast between the black and the white is a lot uh, lower than the contrast between the black and the white here. So unfortunately, when we image, we specifically lose the contrast of these fast changes uh, faster than the slow changes. And that will reduce our contrast. So this is... Um, a well-preserved contrast for slow changes and poorly preserved contrast for fast changes in the uh, in the sample. So the details that change abruptly and often, like for example, if we have a cell full of vesicles uh, or or RNA RNAs, lots of dots, crowded dots with edges, we lose these. The uh, resulting images has a lower contrast uh, than the details that are more even across the image, for example, a hazy background, a cytoplasmic label, yeah, all these things that um, just change very slowly across the image and quite even, they get a, a better contrast. So sample that are very crowded, they are high frequency changes, they correspond to this type of objects and unfortunately the contrast is poorly preserved in the image. So for these type of samples, it is very important to optimize the contrast and we will see today uh, later uh, how to do that. So the image that uh, David showed yesterday of this uh, glomeruli is a typical example where we have lots of edges and uh, uh, so every time you have a line you have two edges right on both sides of a line so and uh, very crowded so this in these images it's important to keep the contrast and uh, preserve to preserve the contrast. So what can we do to enhance the contrast or preserve it? 
you know that in transmitted light imaging, we have optical elements uh, which uh, help us, like DIC and face contrast. We use fluorescence. Uh, the reason why we use fluorescence is because it is, well, uh, many reasons, but one of them is because it's a very high contrast technique with, with like watching the stars during the night. We use optical sectioning, with, which allows us to remove the, <clears throat> to, to not get any emission outside of the focal plane. So either we throw away the uh, emission from the other focal plane, like in uh, single point and, and spin discal focals, or we do not create any um, any emission from the out of focal plane with light sheet and multiphoton, we only excite the focal plane. So we have an optical section. So this is also a way to enhance the contrast. And then of course, we need to prepare samples that uh, do not scatter and do not refract because uh, scattering and refraction lead to a lower contrast because the light is all over the place basically. So make sure you prepare transparent non-refractive samples on the correct cover slips. But there's more. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon, yes. Uh, the noise and the background. So both of them decrease the contrast. So if we have a low signal to noise ratio or a low signal to background ratio, so these two are confused very often by loads of people. But this afternoon, we're going to put this full stop <laughs> to the confusion. So uh, then uh, what we need to do, if you have a low signal to noise ratio, signal to background ratio, we need to either increase the signal or decrease the noise in the background. And uh, we will see this later. Uh, both uh, techniques work and you can combine them. So for example, in here, we have the same sample. So it's this target with lines. Uh, we have the same sample in the same imaging conditions, but the difference between these four images is that we average the image. And when we average the image, we uh, remove the noise or we decrease the proportion of no noise. And you can see quite clearly that in here, we hardly guess where the lines are, and here it's impossible to see them. But uh, even though we have the same optical resolution, uh, here we are able to resolve the line very well, and even here we can see them. So we have decreased the noise in this case, and we have therefore increased the contrast. And you can imagine that this is very easy to segment, whereas here with a low contrast, it's much harder to segment. So segment, remember, it's to make the mask so that we can analyze the image. So without contrast in the image, it's not possible to resolve details, even with excellent optical resolution. Increasing the contrast uh, increases thus the usable resolution, okay? So we have a certain resolu optical resolution and maybe we'll not be able to use all of it. It's limited by something else. And that's what the contrast does. It limits the uh, usable optical resolution. So what about pinholes in confocals? So uh, single point confocals and multi-point confocals have pinholes. Uh, I remind you that in confocal microscopy, the shape of the uh, excitation is an inverted double cone with the highest focal point, the, the, the place where the light, the excitation light is most concentrated is at the focal plane. But we also excite above and below the plane and therefore we also bleach and uh, and these uh, uh, these fluorophores above and below emit light and we throw that away we throw the other emitted light using the pinhole uh, the pinholes uh, and so that increases the contrast in the xy image so when we image here uh, if we are in a wide field situation we see everything that is out of focus but thanks to the pinholes we uh, increase the contrast in the xy image so we increase the, we have a higher usable resolution. So if we look at this at the pinhole diameter here uh, versus the resolution, we can see that in XY actually uh, up to one area unit, we do not have any influence, almost no influence of the pinhole size. Now, what is the one area unit? I said this once, uh, so I just want to remind you, uh, people who use a confocal have a little button in general called 1AU. And so uh, this is a, uh, a cross section across the uh, point spread function. So we can see here the main lobe and these are the rings. And uh, so this is the, the, the main lobe and uh, these are the two radii here and here. One area unit is the distance of the, the diameter of the first ring, the first dark ring. 
on the point spread function. And so if we use here, for example, uh, a four or five nanometer uh, laser and we image blue light, maybe this is the point of the point spread function and the one area unit has a certain size. But if we change wavelength, because the wavelength is, uh, is part of, of this equation, so if we increase the wavelength, uh, clearly this shape is going to change and it's going to become bigger. And so the one area unit is still the diameter of the first dark ring, but you can see that the physical size of it has changed. So one area unit is the way to normalize the size, the diameter of the first dark ring. And when we close the, the pinhole to one area unit, what we do is that we, uh, we close it to the size of the, um, that excludes all the rings basically, regardless of the, um, the wavelength that we use. So this is uh, the normalization of the, uh, of the size of the lobe basically. So when we close the pinhole to one area unit, we can see that something happens. Uh, the um, the XY resolution will go down. So it increases basically the XY resolution. You know, when we have a smaller number, it's a better resolution. So the XY resolution will be improved if we close the uh, pinhole to smaller than one area unit. And in Z, it's different. Uh, in Z, the, uh, as we close the pinhole, if we start with a pinhole of two or three area units, we will have a, a very bad Z resolution because we're not ex excluding um, the, the emission that comes from above and below the planes. But when we, as we get a smaller and smaller pinhole and we get closer to one area unit, then we are getting a better uh, Z resolution because we increase the contrast. And afterwards, it stops somewhere here and it actually stops at 0 0.7 area unit, which basically thinks is like you are excluding part of the main lobe. So clearly, you need to have extremely bright samples to go uh, to, to set the pinhole closer to one area unit, but there are advantages to it because you're getting a better resolution in XY and then up to a certain point, you get still get a better uh, contrast in Z and usable resolution. So the pinhole mostly improves the contrast when it's above one area unit, which is what we use most of the time. But when we go closer to one area, uh, smaller than one area unit, we can also improve the resolution. So the, the pinhole is mostly there for us in, in a practical way to increase the, uh, the contrast. Okay, now that we spoke about contrast, uh, let's talk about pixel size. Um, so pixel size, sampling, digital resolution, these are terms that actually refer to the same thing. So I remind you that a digital image is a matrix of uh, picture elements. So this is what pixels means, picture elements. And each pixel has one XY, X coordinate, one Y coordinate, and a uniform intensity. So I've shown you this picture before. If we have this image of a cell and we zoom in here, we could, uh, we could image this cell with small pixels or large pixels. And you can see that the image looks very, very different. And here we can see the individual pixels and each of them has an X, a Y and a coordinate in each channel. So in here, we have the same optical resolution. So it's the same objective, same wavelength, uh, but we have different pixel size, big pixel sizes, and therefore we have different image resolutions. So clearly the pixel size affects the image resolution. And that's what we're going to talk about. So if we take this little bit here, one of these little bits of sample in here, um, the optical resolution is the distance between the details in the sample that we can resolve, that can be resolved by the objective, right? So this is the optical resolution, it's for the objective. That's the one we have seen before. We know that very well by now. So it's the point spread function and we have this equation in X, Y and this one in Z. But light is everywhere in here. As I said, this is a continuum. So we have light, uh, light all over the place and we have an infinity of values. So it's a function, it's a math mathematical function. To fully describe the optical image, we need an infinity of value. But we can only measure the intensity at discrete points. So we need specific XY and specific intensities for our digital image. 
So let's say we're going to say, okay, I'm going to image here, and image here, and image here. And then I'm going to get three numbers or three sets of numbers. And in each of them, I'm going to get an X, Y coordinate. And I'm going to get an intensity value for the red channel and an intensity value for the green channel. And I do this three times, and that's what I get. And so I'm only measuring here, here, here. So in single point confocals, we are measuring these pixels one by one, but we can measure the channels together because we have several sensors. And in camera-based system, it's the opposite. So we measure all the pixels at the same time, but we have to measure the channels one after the next. But what happens here in between? We are measuring here and we are measuring here. What is the intensity in between uh, the sampling points? Well, the software extrapolates between the sampling, the sampling points to be able to reconstruct the image. So a digital image is a very rough simplification of the optical image. Okay. So the image, as I said at the beginning, the image of a sample is never, never like the sample. And it cannot be like the sample because to start with, the optical image that we're getting is, a, is, is created by diffraction from the light that comes from our sample. So it's already very different, right? It's the rugby man, very different from our sample. On top of that, when we digitalize this optical image, we are making a very, very rough estimate of this image. And this is what we are displaying, and this is what we're analyzing, and this is what we're looking at, and this is how we are judging our sample. So the image of the sample can never be like the sample. It's not even close to what the sample is. Uh, so the distance between the sampling points is the pixel size in the image. So, and the higher you can imagine that if we put, instead of putting just three samples here, three sample points here, we're going to put like 10, we're going to have a better uh, resolution and we will see these squares will look smaller. So the higher the density of sampling points, the smaller the image pixels and the more accurate the data because we're measuring more often. So how dense should the sampling be? This is the question about sampling. How often do we need to uh, image? So now we are going to talk about the Nyquist sampling theorem or criterion. It's the same thing. Hello, my name is Harry Nyquist. Well, actually, my name is Harry Nyquist, and I was born in Sweden. Oh, ho, ho. And uh, when I was 18 years old, I moved to the US with my parents and seven siblings. It was in uh, 1907, 1907. And I became an engineer working with telegraphs and very, very cool stuff. And I'm now very famous because everybody knows the Nyquist sampling theorem. So I want to send you some information about a periodic signal. So this is the periodic signal. And you know, you're far away. This is now the time of telegraphs. It's extremely exciting. You can send information across long distances without having to go on your horse and uh, carry the information. So I have a periodic signal and I want to send you this information. And oops, I go the wrong way. How many sample points do I need to measure on this periodic signal for you to be able to reliably reconstruct the signal? Zillions of points? Yes, absolutely. If you send me zillions of points, I will be able to reliably reconstruct this curve. How about two? Because zillions, that takes a lot of time. So this is the period. So period is between two crests here or between two troughs. Uh, so if I have two per period, can you reconstruct? Yes, I can reconstruct. Well, maybe not, because if you're unlucky and the and the uh, the points are exactly at the center, this is what you're going to get, a straight line. So the Nyquist sampling criteria simply says that you need to have more than two sampling points per period. To uh, they are needed and sufficient to fully describe the curve, OK? More than two sampling points per period. Uh, at least we get a little clue of how much we need to measure. So why do we care? Because we're not working with telegraphs. Well, the Nyquist sampling theorem works for absolutely everything in life, almost. Well, at least it works for microscopy. So uh, it tells us which sampling density enables the, us to reliably capture the information delivered by the objective. So how many times do we need to sample the point spread function and the image that comes, the full image, point spread function is only one 
uh, one floor for, but we have tons of floor fours. We have a very complex image, object, um, optical image. How often do we need to, to sample it to be able to reliably capture this information? If we undersample, which means that we don't have enough points, then we create aliasing artifacts in the image, and we're going to talk about this. So these are the two reasons why we are interested in the Nyquist sampling theorem. So the Nyquist sampling theorem has been uh, adapted for light microscopy. And what it says is that for the details resolved by the objective to be accurately represented in the digital image, the optical resolution must be sampled more than twice. I remind you that the optical resolution is a distance, right? It's a, it's a distance between the two points that can be resolved. So this distance, we must put two, we must have two measuring points within this distance to fulfill the Nyquist uh, sampling theorem. So we are, what we need to do basically is make sure that we resolve digitally what the objective has resolved optically. So we do not want our digitalization to be the limiting factor when the objective has done such a good job at giving us a very nice point rate function. And then afterwards we destroy it when we make a digital image, we don't want that. So the optical resolution must be sampled uh, in two image pixels or more. So basically the image pixel size that fulfills the Nyquist criterion is the optical resolution divided by two or smaller. So we could put three points, we could put four points. So it means we have very, very tiny uh, uh, image pixels, but we cannot have less than two points. So how, uh, so we know now how to calculate the optical resolution, right? 0 0.61 lambda divided by NA. So that we have practiced a lot. And the software most of the time shows you what the image pixel size is. So that is very useful. So you're going to have to go out back to your software and figure out where you can see the even pixel size in your image. And if more than two uh, image pixels fit in the optical uh, resolution, then we have, then the image resolution is the optical resolution. It means the image resolution is limited by the objective. So in that case, we are uh, imaging according to the Nyquist sampling theorem, and this is the resolution in the image. But if we undersample, which means that the uh, digital pixels are too big, the image pixels are too big, then what limits the image, the resolution in the image is not the objective anymore. So it's not this, but it is the sampling. And in that case, the image resolution is, oh, I forgot the little two here. <laughs> Sorry, it dropped somehow is two times the image pixel size. Um, so oversampling, if, if instead of undersampling, we oversample, and instead of having two image pixels in our optical resolution, we have like five, for example, this is called oversampling, and it cannot increase the image resolution beyond the optical resolution. So this is basically our limit. So if we oversample, we maybe take more time into getting too many spots, especially when you use a single point confocal, it takes a lot of time to scan each spot, uh, but we are not anyway going to get a better resolution. So here on the single point confocal, we have the great flexibility. I told you one of the great advantages of single point confocals is that it's flexible. And so we can, we have one pinhole and we can open it and close it. And therefore we can adjust the pixel size, we can also decide which area we're going to match. We are going to, to image. We're going to decide how the distance between the spots. We can change all this. And therefore, we have we can adjust the image pixel size to match exactly the requirements of any objective and any wavelength. So that we have a great flexibility on single point confocals. So how can we change the image uh, pixel size on a single point confocal to make sure that it's we can put two of them in the optical resolution where we can change the field of view by zooming in and out. So we're just talking about one objective, right? We have one objective. We chose this objective for a reason X, Y, Z that we have seen last week. Uh, so we are uh, we have chosen already our objective and we have the wavelength that of the floor four. So these are fixed, but now we want to change the uh, uh, we want to change the image pixel size, and we can zoom in and out. That will change the field of view, and then we can also choose the number of pixels sampling points that fit in the field of view. So uh, and uh, the uh, image pixel size is going to be the size of the full 
uh, field of view divided by the number of pixels that we have chosen. So you choose this on a confocal and you choose this on a confocal. So we have lots of flexibility uh, on a single point confocal. And on top of that, there is a fantastic button <clears throat> in the software. And that is true for all single point confocal. We have a button called Optimal or called Nyquist or called Nyquist Sampling depends on the company. Anyway, all these buttons are exactly the same. What they do is that they change the pixel size so that it matches the optical resolution of the objective and the wavelength. And so they give you the Nyquist sampling pixel size. For example, let's say that you have uh, chosen your objective and you have your uh, wavelength. You decide that you're going to use a zoom number one so that you have a field, uh, field of view. You, do, you basically do not zoom in. So you have a field of view that is uh, the biggest field that you can have. You don't zoom in. And you choose 1024 by 1024 pixels. Uh, that will produce an image with smaller pixels than if you choose 512 by 512, right? Because we have a certain field of view and either we cram in there 1024 pixels or 512. Clearly, if we only put 512 pixels, the pixels are going to be bigger. Okay, so it's all about pixel density within the field of view. So, and you know that very well, if you are uh, in a single point confocal, if you use a 1024 by 20, if you choose 1024 uh, pixels, you're going to scan much slower because we go from one point to the next point, right? And then we go from one line to the next line. So in a single point confocal, this is the way we image. The more the, the number of pixels, the higher the number of pixels and the sl slower it goes. So we have smaller pixels. If we use 1024, uh, we scan slower, but the image resolution is going to be higher, okay? The, compared to 512. So you just need to press the magic button, Optimal or Nyquist, to get the best pixel size. That size, you should not uh, choose smaller size. You, can, shouldn't, you should not uh, choose, uh, if the, you press the, the, the magic button and it tells you that you should use 1024, do not go for 2048, uh, because then you are oversampling and you're not gaining anything, but it goes much slower. So do not oversample. So if the uh, image pixel size is, uh, so two image pixels are smaller than the optical resolution, then we fulfill the Nyquist theorem, right? We have two sampling points within uh, the thing that we want to resolve. Then we have, uh, we, we fulfill the Nyquist theorem. And in this case, the image resolution is the same as the optical resolution. But if two image pixel size do not fit into the optical resolution, so it's larger than the optical resolution that we undersample. And in this case, the image, the image resolution is twice the pixel size that we have. So then the image resolution is limited by the pixel size. So here you can see uh, two uh, point spread functions, one here and one here, and they're very close to each other because the spots are quite close to each other in the sample. And so they are fusing. and uh, they are fusing in such a way that uh, this is just at the limit of the resolution. So this is the distance between the two centers. And this corresponds to also the, uh, the, the, the radius, basically. So it's this measurement. So this is the maximum distance we can resolve with, with the objective that we're using. And if we are using big pixels like this, uh, so you can see that we do not have two pixels inside this uh, smallest distance that we can resolve. So we are under sampling. We only have one and a half or something pixel inside this. So uh, we are under sampling. The choices that we have on a single point confocal is that we can either make the image bigger. This is by increasing the zoom, or we can make the grid smaller. So we can change the, the sampling size and we can keep the same uh, magnification, but we change the, uh, the pixel size by adding more pixels, basically. So our pixels are smaller. So on the single point code focal, we have great flexibility of either zooming in to make the sample bigger and match our pixel size or the opposite. So what about the camera? On the camera-based system, we are very fast, but we do not have this flexibility. We cannot change, mostly we cannot change the, uh, the pinhole size. Uh, we cannot change the, uh, in general, we are, have only one camera and therefore we have fixed pixel camera size. Now this is 
confusing, but the image pixels are different from the camera pixels, okay? So the image pixels are the collection. So these are picture elements. They are the bricks inside the picture, and they are an X, a Y coordinate, and an intensity. And this is the size in, in the sample. So the image pixels, the size is in nanometers. But the camera pixels, these are the light recording devices on the camera chip. So this is a little sensor. And the camera has millions of these little sensors. And they are called camera pixels. So it's unfortunate that they have the same name. But that's the way it is. So I'm very careful into saying either image pixels or camera pixels so that you understand what I'm talking about. So this is basically part of the image. And this is part of the camera chip. And they are, they are much bigger. Their size is in microns. Uh, so this is uh, the size on the sensor, the size of the sensors on the camera chip. So we'll have to get used to the fact that this camera pixels and uh, image pixels, they are not the same thing. And what is the difference between uh, the size of the image pixels and the relationship between the size of the sensors and the size of the um, sample is the magnification. So it's basically um, the, the size of each pixel in the image is magnified by the objective, for example, and then it's going to be the same as the uh, sensor. So the other way we can go as well. Unfortunately, there is no nice button <laughs> as on single point on focals. So, uh, and partly it is because we cannot anyway do much more when we have the camera we have and it has the uh, pixels it has. And so we are stuck with the camera we have. Uh, so the image pixel, size is the size of the camera sensors divided by the magnification. This is the way the relationship between these two. How can we change the image pixel size then on the camera based system if we cannot change the camera? Well, you could change the camera, but it's very expensive. And if you buy a camera with very small pixels, then the images are a bit dimmer. But anyway, this is totally an option. So uh, this is something you want to consider if ever you are in the position of buying a camera. You have to think about the pixel size. We could change the objective or we can change the wavelength, but clearly that changes the optical resolution. We have lots of reasons why we may want one objective uh, or one wavelength comp uh, compared to another. So maybe we are a little bit stuck with this as well. But one option that we have on some microscopes is that we can add an extra magnification. So we add an extra lens that magnifies more. It doesn't change the objective, but it acts, adds the magnification. So we can, using this, we can modify a little bit the, uh, the size of the, um, of the pixels in the, in the image. Uh, but we will have a little bit less photon, so the image is a little bit dimmer, but that's a very good uh, option. Unfortunately, not all microscope uh, manufacturers put this extra magnification by default. Uh, you have to, sometimes you have to add it, like to have to ask when you buy the microscope. And many people who buy microscopes, they don't know about it, so they don't ask for it. And therefore, it's a problem when you don't have it. <laughs> so I think everyone who works with um, uh, everyone who works with um, a camera-based systems will have to go and figure out if they have an extra magnification on their microscopes. And in uh, in yeah, there are different options uh, in our uh, microscopes. All, my, all our Nikon microscopes have a 1.5x extra. And when we talk about the magnification here to calculate the pixel size in the image, we're talking about the full magnification. So the magnification of the objective and the extra magnification lens. So here is an example for a camera-based system. Let's say we're using this objective. It's a 40X uh, NA 0.95 air objective. And our camera has pixels of 6.5 microns. So you see, this is the size of the sensor is quite big microns. So the image pixel size is simply 6.5 divided by 40. And so divided by the magnification, right? So, and then this is what the image pixel size is. Here it's in micron and it means 163 about in nanometers. So this would be uh, the pixel size in the image with this camera and with this magnification. So this is also the smallest distance that the camera can resolve. Clearly it has this small pixels and it cannot resolve more than 163. This is a convenient way. Uh, dividing the pixel size, the camera pixel size by the magnification is a convenient way for you to know what the camera can resolve. 
Uh, so if you don't add any magnification, if you add magnification, then you multiply it, then the pixels become smaller. So when, when we image with this camera and this objective, we image a green fluorophore. So it has, for example, emission 520 nanometers. The optical resolution is what we have seen, 0 0.61 lambda, 520, divided by the numerical aperture of the objective. So this is the optical resolution. We have 300, the objective can, uh, can uh, resolve 334 nanometers. And then these are our pixel size, so two, image pixels, the double of this is 325. So you can see that we can fit these two pixels inside the uh, optical resolution. And therefore we fulfill the Nyquist theorem with this camera, this objective, this wavelength. So the image resolution in that case is the optical resolution, okay? If on the other side, we change objective, we use the same camera and the same wavelength, but we use a 20X air, and a 0.75 objective. The optical resolution becomes 423 because the NA has changed. So this is what the objective can resolve. Uh, and if we look again at the two pixel size with this magnification, then we get 650. And 650 doesn't fit in 423. So now we are in a situation where uh, we cannot fit two image pixel size inside our optical resolution. So the pixels uh, become uh, the limiting factor. So we, the two image pixel size is larger than the optical resolution. So we are under sampling. And in that case, the image resolution is uh, the image pixel size multiplied by two. So it's 650 is the, uh, is the image resolution instead of 423, which the objective is giving us. Okay, so here we have our two point spread functions close to each other, and we have the camera grid, and we can increase, or we cannot change the camera grid on the uh, camera based system, but we can increase the magnification. So this is uh, an option that we have so that uh, the resolution, the distance that we want to resolve is, uh, is measured by two pixels of the camera, one and two. So now we are Nyquist sampling. As I'm talking about changing the camera pixels on the camera-based system, I also want to mention binning, which is the opposite. Instead of, uh, so basically when I bin, I'm going to make the pixels bigger. And uh, uh, this is something that we will use sometimes, but basically what you're doing, so we, I keep saying that we want the smallest pixel possible on the camera, but sometimes we want bigger ones. And uh, so if we uh, take four pixels and we merge them together, so we, we, it's electronically, basically, uh, the camera is going to consider that the four elements, the four sensors that it has uh, are one, then this is called binning. And uh, on all camera-based systems, you're going to have something like this on your uh, software. So you should uh, try to figure out where it is. And uh, so if we bin, for example, two by two, the binning two, what happens is that we have four camera pixels that are the signal from four camera pixels is merged into one large camera pixel. The advantage is that the image becomes brighter, as you can see here, because basically each pixel is four times bigger, so it collects more photons. We can image faster when we bin the camera because there's less processing for the computer. And, but of course we have lower resolution because these pixels are very big. So if we zoom into this image, with the same zoom, you can see here that we are seeing all the pixels. And here we don't see the pixels. Uh, they are dimmer, but they are much smaller, like four times smaller. So the applications for binning are when we want to take an overview of a la very large sample, it's, uh, it's a very good. It goes faster, so you can decrease the illumination because it's brighter as well. And then the reconstruction of the very big image is, uh, is faster as well. So this is one of the application of binning on cameras. So as I was telling you about changing the pixel size. So we are going to take a break now. Oh, I am spot on time, amazing. <laughs> So um, let's uh, come back uh, after the break. Uh, I want to know first if, I know it's, it's a lot of information and it's likely to be a new concept for many of you, uh, but it's, a, it's an important concept as important 